dear to the heart here at Cockroach Labs for sure. And for many people who are in distributed systems, I think this is kind of one of those things that, you know, I mean, once you see it, you can't kind of unsee it. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite the interesting topic. And we're in a, you know, there's a lot of material here. So I'll try to speak um, at, at a good regulated pace. Um, it is the morning, so I haven't really had a whole lot of coffee yet. So it, it's, uh, oh gosh, it's about uh, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. where I'm at. So I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, to be as entertaining as I can this early in the morning. So a uh, bit of housekeeping first, um, you know, please do engage in, in chat. Uh, I, my friend Daniel Holtz is on the, is on the call. Um, Daniel is deeply versed in these topics as well. He has lots of conversations about cap theorem and raft and MVCC, some of the, the deeper principles that, 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 you know, our database is built on, but really lots of distributed systems are built upon. Um, and so we're happy to engage in chat. Um, at the end of the webinar, there'll be a survey. Please do give us feedback. Um, we like to improve these things every time we go out. Um, we get some great feedback and it's extremely valuable to us. Um, so we're trying to do some things in different time zones. We're um, lots of different things that, that we've heard from people over the past couple of months. And then finally, yes, definitely a recording will be available after the event before the inevitable question from somebody um, about that. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely have a recording up and available. In fact, I think we're, we're streaming to, I believe, YouTube and maybe LinkedIn already. So I think that stuff happens pretty quickly. So, um, so welcome to the event. Um, I'm Jim. Uh, I am now a principal product evangelist here at Cockroach Labs. Um, I've been in product marketing for really quite some time, and I was an ex-engineer. Um, you know, I coded professionally in Smalltalk and C++, coded for about, oh gosh, eight or nine years, and I became a marketer because, honestly, salespeople used to drive me nuts. Every time they spoke, they would add, like, you know, eight months of scope to whatever project I was on, so... Um, so, so it's been my job to really help kind of explain these, these deeper contexts, deeper concepts, uh, um, in, 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 in kind of regular terms, uh, hoping that, that people get this. I'm originally electrical engineering, computer science major. Um, and then on Twitter, I am James, J-A-Y-M-C-E. So not a whole lot of interest in stuff there other than like I talk about baseball and some other things, eh, you know, lots of, uh, cockroach lab stuff. So. Um, so, so again, thank you for joining. Um, the session is intermediate. Um, a couple caveats. Look, at, I, I'm not a distributed systems expert. I work with a whole lot of experts. I work with some really amazing people, you know. And you know, to work at a place where you know, uh, you know, you post something on Hacker News and it accelerates to the first page, you know, it's just a whole lot of fun. Um, but I'm curious, and I absolutely love the technology on uh, which which I re I've been representing for years, and. I think it's really important to actually get some of these topics. Um, you know, uh, I think distributed systems is the wave of the future. I think, uh, you know, building your own distributed mindset is something that, you know, I speak a lot about because I think it's actually really important. Um, I think this is the way that things are going. I think if you look at the history, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, of where we come from and, and, and where we're at today, I think you'll see that, that a lot of these concepts are, are kind of critical to, to the future of computing, the future of kind of industry and the, our, what we all do, right? And I think this stuff has changed the world. And, and I like to expose you know, the, the people who have, have been involved in this because I think it's actually really, really pretty, pretty critical stuff. So we're gonna talk about the cap there, but along the way, uh, we have to cover things like Raft, which is a distributed consensus protocol, um, multi-version concurrency control, MVCC, and then, you know, it's a concept of active active from a from a database point of view what that actually means so all right so everybody thank you i see oslo and the netherlands and france and moscow and portugal i'm very very happy to see everybody across uh, europe and beyond uh, uh join us today uh and, and so welcome and i know daniel's somewhere in the uk i think wales and then i am in chicago so uh thanks everybody for joining so we, we really do have a nice uh represent representation across the entire planet now if I'm going to start to talk about kind of movements and what I feel is a movement, this distributed system movement, I, I kind of feel like it, I have to go to the past a little bit. And there's, there's been a couple of different collections of people over the past 30 to 40 years, 50 years, really, for that matter, that have really changed our society. If I have to go way, way back to Fairchild Semiconductor and, you know, there was a, you know, Fairchild is really kind of the, one of the very first kind of like modern computer companies or, you know, information technology companies, you know, started in the Valley way back. And, and you know, this, this group of guys here, the, the Fairchild, the treacherous eight, they're called, they left Fairchild and they started Intel. 
and, and, and the, the innovation that's happened at Intel over the past, oh gosh, 40, 50 years has just been incredible. Um, and so, so we started there. And then I think the second large moment in, in, in kind of large collection of people is Xerox. Funny enough, I, you know, Xerox, I mean, the, the copy machine people started something called the Palo Alto Research Center. And, and, and out of that, out of the, the our park place is what they call that, P-A-R-C, came kind of the, the modern PC. Everything we think of when we think of Windows, the mouse, um, they had a language called Smalltalk that came out of there. Um, really, the genesis of what you know this 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 Mac that I'm working on today uh, was really came out of the Palo Alto Research Center, and it's another big kind of moment in time. And we fast forward a little bit, and you think through you know digital was a huge, huge, super huge, important company in the '80s and '90s, um, and you think about risk architectures and kind of the, the you know kind of modern machines, and think about uh, you know like instruction pipelining and uh, massive, huge, huge innovations. There was a huge uh, research group at, at digital as well. You know, digital is kind of called DEC. It was data general at one point. And, you know, somewhere in the, the mid nineties, it got sold to Compaq and, you know, Compaq kind of lost its way in terms of PCs and kind of started to, to disband this group. And, and I talk about this group because it's actually pretty important. There's a great, huge, massive amount of great individuals at digital at the time. And a lot of them ended up at this little small company in 99, 2000 called Google. Uh, and Google was just this emerging company that, you know, people were kind of like, oh, okay, you have a search engine, which is this simple bar. What is that all about? And, and I think what's happened uh, really in the past 20 years from, from that moment in time until today is really defining what I feel the next 20 years is going to be. I think that group of people that started there um, is, is kind of the, the genesis of, of cap theorem and everything else. And, and I, I do that because I think the history here is actually pretty important. Um, if you go to Google in the 2000s, there's two gentlemen um, that worked at Google, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gimawan. Uh, between the two of them, if, if you look at some of the innovations that they've driven and, and really how they've affected our lives, it's truly tremendous. MapReduce, which is you know, the, was the core of kind of, you know, this, this big data movement and, and, you know, Hadoop that's used all over the place on um, those concepts, big table, which is the genesis of NoSQL, um, the Google file system and the way that the back end of, of you know, architecting these things at massive scale um, spanner, which is really the, the white paper in which cockroach size is built off of, but even TensorFlow. Um, you know, these two basically kind of are, are really responsible for the, I, I feel the modern internet and, and I, as a, as a student of history, I feel it's also, also very important to actually um, talk about these two because I think they're, they're probably two of the most important people in our lives that a lot of people don't know who they are. If you want to go read more about them, I think this article is a really, really good, good um, description of, of them and, and then what they've done. And I think it's, it's truly tremendous. And I think it's important to talk about them because they, they, they have redefined. If you, it, another good read, and this is a quick little link. Um, this is way back, and I think this is like 2001, Jeff Dean wrote this, and it was really kind of, to me, this is a vision of what we're doing today. Um, completely prophetic and pretty awesome and, and just complete massive, huge brains on these two. And it's just awesome. So, um, but let's just side note before I move on to the next topic, um, Spencer, Peter, and Ben, Peter, Spencer, and Ben in the picture, sorry. Um, they were also at Google in the early 300s and worked, worked very near these guys. Um, you know, I think their employee numbers are in the mid 300s. Um, I know Peter and Spencer actually built Google Colossus, which was the next generation of Google file system. Um, and they, they saw Bigtable, they saw Megastore, they saw Spanner. Uh, ben was responsible for, in large part for the engineering and Google Reader. So just massive, huge distributed systems. So again, you know, I, I link back to this time because it's actually pretty important. Now, there's this other gentleman, Eric Brewer, who, um, you know, at the same time in the early 2000s was working at a company called Intomi. Now, Intomi, if anybody remembers, they kind of really kind of pioneered the concept of enterprise search. And, and we're really just kind of massive in the, in, the search, uh, in the search world. And, you know, Eric was the founder of this place. And there's lots of people that worked at Intomi and ended up in lots of other places. The, the, the Intomi group is actually pretty intense. And, you know, Eric went on to Intel for a while. Um, and then he's been a professor at UC Berkeley. He ended up joining Google in, in around 2011, um, which is actually a pretty huge moment in time. And, and, and I bring this up because actually the cap theorem is actually Brewer's theorem. 
Eric Brewer is, is responsible for actually bringing us, bringing us the cap theorem. Um, he started at, did I? Yeah. Yeah. He actually, he was, he was talking about this in the two thousands while he was at, he told me there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of um, discussion about, you know, what is it going to take to, you know, do we need to relax um, standards and, and relax kind of protocols around um, acid and, and make this something called base, which is basic availability, soft state, and eventually consistent. Sounds a lot like NoSQL to me. Um, but there was a lot of debate around this, and there's some papers that he put out that were about that. And then in 99, he published uh, the CAT principle, um, IEEE CS paper, um, and then at the principles of distributed systems, principles of distributed concepts, 2000. Uh, he did talk at 8.30 in the morning on July 19th talking about this exact thing and talking about the cap theory. And I just kind of feel like that moment in time, July 19, 2000, I'll fast forward 20 years later, we're, we're really actually living in this world. Um, the thing was proved actually about two years later by two people from MIT. So um, it became a, a theorem in 2002. It's actually Brewer's theorem, um, actually. I mean, I think we call it cap theorem because that's really ultimately kind of what, you know, I think the principles are all about, right? So a little bit of history before we kind of get into this. Um, Eric joined Google in um, 2011. Interesting enough, there's this another Wired article that talks about you know how he's how he basically joined the team to rethink the whole backend infrastructure of what was happening at Google at the time, and that was really the moment in time where things really started to take off for Google. Um, he he, I think his desk was a few desks away from Jeff Dean and, and Sanjay Gamawat. So there's this collection of people that were really kind of redefining things, and he didn't rewire the whole thing. I think he was. One of the main forces in terms of helping to re-architect, but even he says he's a very humble person who talks about, you know, lots of different people in the company. And, and I think Google's done a great job of hiring and, and, and really kind of pushing forward a lot of different things. So um, if you want to learn more about distributed systems, kind of any of these things, I find these the Google's done a great job. Uh, I think it's called Google Publications. You know, they publish a lot of these papers. A lot of the stuff that I have screenshots about is all there. Um, and you know. There's, there's a couple of articles here by, by Eric that are pretty amazing. Um, he talks about the CAP theorem 12 years later and kind of how the rules have changed. Uh, he's also on a little paper called Borg, Omega, and Kubernetes, uh, which uh, also instrumental in kind of pushing forward Kubernetes. And that, that all pushed over the past couple of years. So um, also some really interesting stuff. And so if you want to learn more and read more about those papers, there's lots of good stuff there. Uh, and I think it's just called Google Publications. The, the link there will get you there. So, all right, so great. All that, let's get to the cap theorem, Jim, right? So the cap theorem states basically, it's impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide more than two out of the following three guarantees. Consistency, so first of all, every read receives the most recent write or an error. So I, I know I'm gonna have the same data no matter what I ask any, any part of the entire system. Availability, basically, if I ask anything in the system, any node or piece of the system, I'm gonna get guaranteed response. It may not be right, but I'm gonna get a guaranteed response. And then it's gonna be partition tolerant, which means basically like the system as a whole can continue to work, even if there's some sort of disc misconnection between pieces of it, right? So say network drops or something like that, there's a delay, right? <clears throat> and that really is a thing. And so it's basically saying like, look, you have one of these three things. So we look at that, right? We're driving trim. Um, again, right? So if two requests are made from two different sources, just visually, um, two different nodes of a distributed data store, then you'll get the same data. So here we have two systems asking, they're going to get the exact same data. It's going to be consistent, and that's a guarantee. Availability, I'm just going to get a response. Is it on or not? Um, and that's another piece of that. And then this, this partition tolerant, um, I'm going to continue to operate even when things aren't there. Now, this guarantee is a little bit special. Um, if you look at the cap theorem, you think about consistency, availability, and partition tolerant. Partition tolerant is, is not something that you would like optimize for. Partition tolerant is kind of one of these, these problems or a concept that would drive issues for consistency or availability. So people, when you typically think about cap theorem, you typically think about like the joining of, of, of you know, two of these three things, you're thinking about CP or AP. Um, you know, you want to be consistent and partition tolerant or available and partition tolerant. And that's typically how these things work, right? Um, so a CA database is a consistent and available, right? It means basically uh, you're going to do this. This is basically a single instance of Postgres, right? Like, because 
if it's not partition tolerant, then what are you what are you doing this for, right? Because that is exactly what what MySQL and Postgres are, right? A single instance, there is no partitions. That, that that's the only thing that's going to survive is without the partition tolerant. So this to me is just a a general database. This, this is the very soul of the concept. It's it, it's not distributed, right? Um, because it, it doesn't have partitions. So you wouldn't think about a CA database. However, an AP database is something we do think about. These are the NoSQL databases. This is, you know, Mongo and HBase, you know, these, these things where we're talking about, you know, I can survive the failure of say a partition or, you know, a, a connection, but I'm still gonna get a response. It may not be right. It may be eventually consistent, but I'm gonna get a response, right? And so lots of databases, like I typically think of the NoSQL databases like that. CP databases have been thought about, but are very difficult to actually do. Um, you know, to, to optimize for consistency takes some very um, tricky engineering to get done. Um, but you're going to be guaranteed you're going to get that, that every request is going to receive the same response no matter what. Now, this is Spanner. This is Cockroach. There's a couple of these other kind of distributed SQL databases that are out there that are interesting, right? Um, and so each of them have their own kind of way of doing this. Hold on, y'all. I'm just making sure. Okay, good. No chat yet. So, um, and so CP database is kind of what we're going to talk about today. And a little bit about availability too. So how do you implement consistency in the database? Well, there's two key concepts here. Um, and by the way, a whole lot of really amazing engineering work uh, behind the scenes here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it in the concept of, you know, really cockroach database and, and the team and some of the stuff that I've seen happen here. So we're going to explore a little bit about Raft and a little about multi-version concurrency control. Working in tandem, these two concepts, these two kind of distributed systems concepts, help get consistency in a database, yet still overcome the partition tolerance, right? So if, if, you know, if I have a transaction happening in Sydney and the same time a transaction happened in Berlin, and say, you know, there's there's a there's a you know, there's a conflict between these two at the same time. Who wins, right? Are they going to go in order, right? The, the timing is going to be important. Um, but if if say, you know, I have a transaction going on in Sydney and 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 data is written across the world, and I lose connection to say the United States and to Europe, can I commit that that transaction? I cannot. I, I cannot survive that. I cannot survive like the entire system being, you know, disconnected. Could I survive one connection being disconnected so that I can say, hey, look at, as long as I can connect to one other node in the system, I'm going to be able to write? Yes. And that's the concepts that are at work here because, you know, ultimately in a, in a, in a consistent database and these kind of, to survive these partition tolerances, right? A, a partition going away, typically they're going to, they're going to you know, commit things like a, a quorum write so two of three nodes can actually commit uh, a, a record, right? So that's how you're kind of getting this, this, this making sure that data gets committed, but the consistency is always going to be the same. And Raft is really what's, what's really kind of governing that. Now, Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm. Excuse me, y'all, I need a little coffee. Um, what this does is it helps us provide kind of atomic rights and consistent reads. Atomic rights really means basically like, look, at it, it's, it's really with the first guarantee in ACID, right? The, the transaction itself, you know, everything that's going to happen in that in that query of that transaction is going to happen uh, end to end. It's not going to do halfway. It's not going to be three quarters. It's going to it's going to have that entire thing, and it's going to happen everywhere I need to make it happen uh, in a distributed system. Okay, and it's also going to make sure that we get consistent reads, so that no matter where I ask for this data, I'm going to get the right information. Okay, now Raft is is pretty intense. Um, I'm going to do my best to describe it, but um, Raft is, is comprised of really a Raft group. A Raft group is an odd number of replicas. So on the right-hand side, you can kind of see that. Um, it's cheery, chatty protocol. And there's gossip going on between all of them to make sure that they're there. And then there's a heartbeat so that they actually kind of stay in sync with each other, right? So these, these three kind of pieces of information are, are all talking to each other one. Now there's a special replica, and that replica is called the Raft leader. Um, in, in, in Cockroach, we call this the leaseholder. Um, so if you ever read our documentations, we're calling it. Um, the raft leader is elected by the group. So the, the three members get together and they say, okay, great. One of you has got to be a raft leader. And then the other two are followers. Now the raft leader is special because they coordinate all rights and they propose commands to the followers, which means basically when I want to write a row, 
um, to this group. Um, I'm going to talk to the raft leader. The raft leader is going to coordinate with the follower. And as long as at least one of the followers commits and he can commit or she can commit, I should say, eh, it's a leader. As long as two or three can commit, you're going to be able to commit that record. Um, and then the leader can serve authoritative, up-to-date information. You're always going to be sure to have the most recent information um, by communicating with that raft leader. But you still have copies of this information in other places, right? So this is what the replicas are doing now. Um, you know, you could, you, could, you could relax those things in certain queries and whatnot um, in a database that implements this sort of thing. Um, but, but just for this purpose, we're going to talk about, you know, the raft leader being kind of the number one and, and really kind of the authoritative source and the controller, the, the, the leader amongst all this. Now, it allows us with something called atomic replication. So um, what we're doing is we're saying, look at, let me, let, me, let me make sure that when I write, so I'm going to insert some values into a table, I speak to the raft leader, it's going to make sure that I'm going to get quorum. Right, that all of the, the, the followers have a knowledge receipt, like I said, like, so great. I talked to the raft leader, it talks to at least one. It's going to say, great, I have quorum, two of three have committed. I now can commit that transaction. And the third replica can just catch up whenever, even if it went away, maybe there was a partition tolerance and that replica went away. It would even be able to survive that because I had two or three. And this helps us with consistency, okay? So this actually a really, really key concept. Um, like I did my best to describe it. Raft is, is fairly complex. I think there's this really wonderful description of Raft out on the internet. Um, if you want to go check it out, the secret lives of data.com. Um, it's over on the right-hand side. It gives a really, really wonderful kind of graphic representation of what happens in Raft and how leaders are reelected and all these different things. So um, more really interesting stuff. So I go check that out if, if you want. So, okay. So that's Raft, um, kind of a, a key kind of distributed system concept. Rep replica group, raft leader, consensus, and quorum, right? Okay, so now let's talk about something a little bit more intense, multi-version concurrency control. Uh, and this is really what's helping us kind of understand um, transactions so that there's no kind of overlap, right? Think about this as um, the I in ACID. In, 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 in ACID transaction, I, I stands for isolation. And isolation means, you know, basically, can that, can that, can that transaction happen uh, by itself without any kind of issue with it, right? Like, so that there, you aren't going to have dirty reads or phantom reads or non-repeatable reads. There's, there's lots of issues that could go on in distributed systems because things don't get committed at the same time, right? And I was talking about, you know, transactions getting committed from one part of the planet to the next, who wins, like, and is the data going to be correct all the time? Um, what happens when one transaction occurs while another one is actually happening and I only get halfway written and, you know, I was joining or I was, you know, writing on 15 different tables, you know, that, that, that isolation um, and the atomicity actually go together to actually make sure that, that there's never going to be any overlap. You're going to have these like weird Frankenstein records in your database. And so isolation, gets really, really important, <clears throat> especially when you're talking about consistency because you want the same record coming from, from all over the place. Right. So, okay. So let's get into this a little bit. It's, it's a little bit more, um, a little bit of flow here. Um, I will tell you um, the the representation of this on Wikipedia is extremely well written, honestly. Um, and so if you want to actually read through it, the, if you just Wikipedia MVCC, it, it's actually pretty good. So there's there's three main concepts here that, that we're going to use. There's a transaction, it's something we want to do to the data. There's a timestamp for that transaction. And then there's an object or a row of data um, that we actually want to, to interact with, right? Okay, so for a simple transaction, this is this is pretty easy, right? So at time zero, we simply create a transaction and we place a timestamp on that and it's the timestamp is zero, right? And what we do is we send that over to the object and we create a write timestamp. So that's we're at time time zero zero one, right? So there's two there's two timestamps on each object, right? That we don't actually write to. So the write timestamp is is 01. Um, what we're going to do immediately, we create a temp object. Um, this is just something that happens in the background um, so that we can do work without having this kind of half complete state, right? So I can do work in a temporary object and then basically commit everything back, right? And so at this point, um, the right transaction has been incremented, but the read remains the same because we're, we're in a good state, right? And so right now, I, if I read from that object, I'm going to be good, but my right thing has actually been increase. It's actually higher than, than my initial, you know, transaction stamp, right? And so what happens is I, the, 
if this is at time zero, zero, two, um, it takes us a second, yeah, it's usually less than that. Um, the temporary object clears everything out, writes it to the main object and restamps the read timestamp to three and acknowledges back to that transaction, okay? So what's happened is I'm using this concept of a temporary object and I have these two timestamps. So the last write came in at one second and then the read, it committed, it did all its work and the read, it took two seconds and my latest read timestamp came in as three. So in between, if I had had another transaction come in and it was lower than that read timestamp, it would say, hey, wait a second, I'm not in good space here. I, I can't read that. It's not right. It's not consistent. It's not the right information because something's going on with this object. That's how you're going to know that that's going on, right? So let's walk through that, right? Let's walk through a conflict, right? So here we are, time zero. Transaction is happening. Timestamp is 01. I write this thing. Okay, great. The right timestamp goes to one, right? Um, I create the temp object so I can do work in it. And the time stamps are updated. Okay, so at the time, I created this temp object. So at that moment in time, at two seconds, another transaction comes through, right? It has a timestamp of 002, okay? What it's doing is it's looking at the read timestamp and it's saying, wait a second, my, my transaction timestamp is actually higher than this read timestamp. So it needs to be lower than that. So I'm committed. I know I have the right thing, right? And so it's, there's, a, there's a conflict here. So we have to deal with this and resolve with it. So a lot of times, what when this happens in a distributed system, you have to have your your, your you have to have try catch blocks and have to retry things if there's if there's conflicts like this. Now this is where the concept of time becomes very important in a distributed system. Um, you know the original Spanner paper um, was really built off the concept of atomic clocks, and atomic clocks is what keeps this time correct all over the place. And atomic clocks is, is physical hardware that's in the machine. And cockroach, what we have is we 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 are using software. Uh, we use NTP and some logical drift and some software around that to actually get this time right. Um, and so um, we deal with this in 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 great detail. So there's a great great blog post of um, living without. I think it's called living without atomic clocks. It's actually I think probably the most popular blog post of all time in our in our blog role, which is really tremendous. And it talks a fair amount about this. So basically what we're doing is we have a conflict and we now have to deal with that. So this is how we are making sure that two transactions are not gonna conflict. And now you have this basic sense of consistency. Now doing this in you know, a single system or a single region or a single AZ, yeah, you know, not that difficult, but I tell you what, doing this um, across the globe, uh, it, it's, truly, truly difficult work. And some of the software engineering that's gone into this uh, in terms of, you know, allowing us to have these kind of atomic rights um, across large distances where, you know, the, the speed of light is no joke. I mean, we're talking, you know, a hop underneath an ocean is, is a fair amount of time. Um, and there's some really interesting kind of software that's gone into this. Another, we, we wrote a Sigma paper that um, um, talks about parallel commits and some of the things that we're doing that kind of help with some of this stuff. So, some more interesting stuff. I, I always think about the code base at Cockroach DB or Cockroach Labs to be kind of a, a PhD in, uh, in in distributed systems. So, oh, I see Daniel uh, posted the Atomic Clock blog post. It, the thing is really, it's a, it's a great read. So, um, so that's kind of MVCC when there's a conflict. So long story short, basically on this is, it's like you're standing in line at a store, you go one after another, each transaction, right? This is what's gonna guarantee that, right? This is what's gonna allow you to kind of deal with these conflicts, right? All right, so I hope this is valuable thus far. Um, I know you got a little deeper there, um, but but hopefully so far so good. Not not so, not a whole lot of stuff in the chat. So, and I hope I'm talking slow enough so that people can understand. I'm trying here. It's early. Okay. So, um, and I always give a caveat. I'm just a marketing guy, so it, 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 the concepts are right. Okay. All right. So good. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think from the, the Netherlands saying enjoying it thus far. So great, awesome. Thank you guys. Okay, so um, that's that's consistency, right? That's that's talking about different nodes that are distributed, straight, getting the same data. The data is going to be consistent everywhere. Raft and MVCC are critical to that, right? Now let's talk a little bit about availability, right? And and how that's a little bit different. Um, if two requests are made, you're always going to get a response. So the data is going to be available everywhere. You aren't going to be sure that it's going to be correct. Again, this is like NoSQL, eventually consistent database. You know, it just means like, I don't know. I mean, sometimes data is going to be wrong, right? So for certain workloads, it might be great, right? But, but storage here, raft, 
Raft again is a critical concept in, in the concepts of, of availability as well. Okay, so um, what do we do with databases today when we wanna have availability? Um, you know, kind of one of the, the main things we think about is we think about these, you know, active passive systems, you know, where we have a primary and secondary system and we're synchronizing the data where, you know, a, a, a transaction comes through, we write it to the primary and then, you know, we'll, we'll synchronize that over to the secondary once it commits so that we, we have the secondary that's kind of always up and running. And then, you know, if the primary dies, right, if the primary goes away, then the secondary is going to come online and we use that database. Now, there's a lot of issues with this. I think this is outdated, uh, in, in my opinion. I think distributed systems look at this and say, there's a much there's a much better way here. This is this is craziness. And if you think about the concepts of raft and our replicas and where we place data and you know start start to think through like wait how can we use that to to kind of rid ourselves of this because there's a lot of issues here. Um, you know you're going to have synchronization issues. Um, it it just happens. Um, things can go down. Uh, you know network packets can get lost. Maybe you get back from that. Use CDC these sort of things, but. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, when 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 a secondary comes online and a primary goes back on, how do you remediate between the two of those? Because my primary was down for so long. Am I just doing a full copy of the secondary back to the primary? Well, where is my? Is there a third area that's actually in production while I have that one offline, right? And so, like, getting this steady state resolution between a primary and secondary when there is an issue, big big problems. It's also costly. Like you have these two huge massive machines, you have two big database licenses and basically one's sitting there not doing a damn thing. And you're just kind of wasting compute, right? I think we've, we've, we've kind of addressed this a little bit over time. I, you know, this concept of having kind of shared storage underneath these two databases. So, you know, any databases really can be thought of as three layers, right? There's, there's a language, there's execution and there's storage. You know, this concept of kind of having distributed storage underneath this is interesting. But even that gets tricky, right? How do you do this across multiple different regions? Right? You know, you're gonna have a single write node. Um, you aren't solving the problem, right? You're, you're addressing it kind of at, at a layer. Um, you know, the concept of distributed systems to me is about re-architecting everything from the ground up to be just that distributed. And I think that's kind of the, the trick here. And so, so if you look at this, this concept and say, great, this is active passive backup. Um, well, oh gosh, by the way, but before I move on, this is what I was a little talking about. We also have to survive regional failures, right? Because look at the whole East Coast of the United States could go out and I need to back up to some other some other area. A, a cable underneath the ocean can can get cut. Uh, you know, so there's this two data center active passive backup thing that actually happens as well. And so active active really kind of takes the concepts of distributed systems and applies it to this problem. And so what it looks like is it's just a, let me just get a cluster of nodes and let that all look like one single logical store. Every node can receive can receive a read and a write, so it's kind of this massively multi-master system. Um, every node is an endpoint, and by every node being an endpoint, that's really critical to the to this availability word, right? Because I mean that's that's the very concept of being available is that I can get a response from from any node in the system. I don't have these these weird nodes that aren't participating, right? I, I, every node is the same, and every node can actually service a query, and it could access the data anywhere. Right, it, this really kind of eliminates all this kind of weird synchronization that we're doing because we're using Raft to do that now. Uh, we can span the globe. Um, we can address. We can start to address the physical limitations of speed of light, like we we're talking about. We we're talking about parallel commits. That this 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 concept that's on our blog. Another one is really really cool. I'd love to bring that one up because it's pretty pretty awesome. Uh, and then you know, well for us, an active active relational database speaks SQL because I I just you know the 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 relational model and <laughs> relational databases, I guess, is what I'm, I'm more used to, you know, like having referential integrity, being able to do joins, um, you know, aggregate views, you know, secondary indexes, these sort of things. You know, using the document model um, to me limits that. Uh, and I think there's a lot of power in some of the systems and things that we do. So being able to do that and doing it at scale across an entire globe, yet still kind of ensuring consistency. We're going to come back to that at the very end, but this is just to, to do active, active relational database, right? So first of all, um, you know, familiar SQL means, well, it's just a relational database. So I have, I have tables. Uh, I don't, you know, it's, it's I, I guess I kind of lost in the document model. I, I think I lost it somewhere around XML, y'all. I don't know. Um, but there's just tables, you know, with, with columns and rows. 
um, and, and, and raft is used to write these things in triplicate across multiple different nodes in the system. So, you know, here we have some records here, Schmidt, Wagner, Mueller, um, Schneider. Uh, it's for my German friends, I, I get some German names in there. So the Mueller record is gonna be written three times across that system and it's gonna be written on three physical nodes so that the data is gonna survive the failure of one of these nodes, right? So raft is gonna do this. Now, one of those instances of Mueller is gonna be by the raft leader, but that's exactly what's going on. We're using raft to actually distribute the data for availability. So that concept is actually coming back, right? Now, every node in this is a, is a gateway to the entirety of the database. So every node can, can accept a read or a write, and it doesn't matter where the data resides. Right, so so the developers don't know, need to know where to go. It just they just ask any node, any endpoint, right? So so the concept of everything being an endpoint is actually truly phenomenal. So here we go. We're going to select Mueller from people, and this user is actually located. Maybe this is a node that's in the UK. I don't know. It's Daniel, um, and he's asking something. He's asking a node that doesn't have that that information. That node is smart enough to actually find out where the raft leader is. The raft leader is in the middle and the top. It's going to go there. It's going to get it. It's going to return it back to the user, right? And so that's the, the intelligence of the distributed system, right? It's going to go to the raft leader to get the most. It's going to be sure. It's going to have the right information and it's going to be back, right? Um, again, on the right-hand side, you have another user asking for Wagner. Wagner is written in the one on the bottom right. Um, he's able to go find that information, right? The raft leader for that particular user. Now, look at, we can actually tie data to location so that, you know, the raft leaders are, are located very close to people. Um, that's kind of another concept unique to Cockroach and Cockroach DB, but um, kind of one of these things that, you know, when we think about CAP theorem, when we think about CP and AP and two different databases, there's also a range of consistency. There's a range of availability and how you can control those things as well. You know, can we get five nines availability? Yeah, I think so. So we also need to survive regional failures. So often nodes will reside across zones in, in multiple data centers, um, and they're gonna coordinate all these transactions that we were talking about before. But this is gonna allow us for these kind of low latency access to data um, within and across regions, because I need to survive the failure of an entire region. So here, looks like Texas went out. Um, and so now do I have copies of that data left in region two and in region one? Well, my load balancer, I can just actually redirect to a different region and now all my users are still accessing that data. So I've completely avoided uh, downtime of say an entire region. Now we need to intelligently place the data across you know, multiple different nodes in this, in this concept, but um, it just basically when the region comes back online, it simply redistributes the, redistributes the data nothing was lost. And uh, so this is how you get, how you get to this point. We have this zero downtime, yet you're still promising, you know, low latency access to, to, to users, no matter where they're at, right? Um, and so kind of this, this kind of really interesting concept. I, we've done this uh, in, in Cockroach, you know, we're, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking through how this stuff works. Um, it's not simple to actually implement. And we've been building this for five and a half, six and a half years now. And over the past year, we've we've actually tried to make this whole concept of surviving regional failures or or, or doing data in kind of this, this multi-region point of view as simple as possible. We wanted to basically break it down to really simple DML so that a developer can actually do this if they wanted to, right? So basically, when you create a cluster, you're just defining cluster regions, uh, you're defining database regions. Um, and, and basically, from that point, we can actually do a whole lot of interesting things to, to automatically optimize um, survivability uh, and, and, and zone failures, right? What we're gonna do by default, everything is gonna survive AZ failures, uh, but we can actually, we can, we can change an entire database to survive region failures. And what that means is for the database in particular, the, the entirety of the database, all data is gonna be written in say three regions. So each node has a region assigned to it. And then when I write data, it's gonna make sure that I have data in three different places. We could actually do it at the table level as well. So I want to have, you know, different patterns so that I have, you know, some data I, I know I have to survive from a regional point of view. I'm going to do exactly as I'm doing. I have one of the three replicas in each, each of the three regions. But but maybe I want, you know, um, you know, I, 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 want, I want low latency reads from all the regions. It's going to actually allow us to have these kind of follower reads in other places and whatnot, right? And so there's lots of stuff that we can do. Um, we can actually tie data to location too. So say, 
all you know records that are of German descent live in German servers. We can actually do that so that you know all three replicas are in one spot. Um, really kind of really configurable down to the to the row level um, on each table and all via DML um, within the database itself. So um, it's kind of one of those special things that that we're doing in Cockroach. It's a little bit different, but um, all this work that we've done around availability and consistency allow us to actually do a whole lot of stuff. So yeah, this is what I was talking about, about moving data to particular places, right? Okay, so again, Raft was used extensively here. Um, and I, I just can't get past, you know, Raft. There's another protocol called Paxos, which some other um, distributed systems use. Um, I'm less familiar with that one. I would go check that out if you're interested in these things. Um, but both are, are interesting kind of distributed consensus protocols that, that definitely are, are, are distributed census algorithms. So, so that's kind of availability, right? So we're talking about, you know, the data is going to be available everywhere, right? Um, so again, CAP theorem, really to, to kind of summarize all the concepts together, right? It just says basically it's impossible to have two of these. It's impossible to have all three of these things. You have to, you can only have two. And it really comes down to AP databases and consistent databases. And that's really kind of how it all comes together. Now, I will contend that you can be consistent and partition tolerant. It's still fairly pretty great availability. Um, and it really comes down to how you want to actually go implement um, the distributed system itself. Um, and, you know, and, and you know, some of the, the ability to kind of tie data to locations and thinking about availability at the, at the table level. Um, and avail and at the row level actually um, gets really really interesting because it's it's not all your data, you know. I think if you start to think about you know the the cap theorem and raft and what this actually means, you know the the concept of having a you know an active passive database where you have you know it's surviving across two regions doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you want to be able to actually survive a whole regional value. You want three copies, which means three regions. So it's kind of like one of these things you start to, you start to develop this distributed mindset. It means, great, I need these things in multiple different places. And that means three or more. This is kind of one of those, those unique things around availability. Um, you're still going to be guaranteed consistent, right? And a lot of the work that we've done in our database to actually get that out there is actually pretty important. Uh, and that, by the way, I'm not saying available databases or AP databases are bad. I think that, you know, depending on your workload and what you want to actually accomplish, understanding what's right um, for what you, what, what you need and what the requirements are, I think is the, the critical point here. Um, you know, I think, like I said, I think getting to have consistency in an AP database is going to be, it's pretty difficult to do. Um, reworking one of these databases to actually deliver consistency um, I think there's just a lot of stuff that happens at the storage layer to actually, you know, prove out the, the MVCC and, and Raft and actually make all that stuff work. And so I think coming at it from a consistency point of view and making that available um, is, you know, for, well, you know, for, for me and, and many of our customers seems to be the, the right approach. So, so that's it. Um, you know, Cockroach DB comes in three different flavors. You go out and do this stuff today. In fact, Cockroach DB serverless, which is it's single cloud, single region right now. It's a newer product for us. Um, you know, we actually go out and start today. We have a free version of that up to five gigabytes. So you can actually start using Cockroach today. Um, this is just a relational database for free uh, in the cloud, which is actually pretty cool. But really Cockroach DB dedicated um, is, is the ideal way to consume Cockroach. Um, you know, we, this is a, a cloud version of it managed as a service. Um, we take care of all the SRE work. Uh, we provision everything for you. So um, you can go out and try this today. Um, just come to our website, but you know, ultimately to us, we want to make development environments the same as you've always had, but we want to take away all the errors and all the issues with scale, all the issues with the operations, eliminate the concept of downtime completely and, and allow you to really kind of become cloud native and, and really kind of move towards the cloud. You know, for us, that's, this is kind of the vision and, and what we want to do. And I think these distributed systems are all moving everybody in this direction. How do we get to this, this level of automation um, and, and this level of availability that, that truly is kind of next level stuff? Because this is Google infrastructure for everyone else. This is what the team at Google has been kind of working towards, you know, for 20 years and, and is now gifted to the rest of us as we kind of build out the next generation of systems. So, all right. So that, that was a lot. I hope it was valuable. It was about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So um, I don't think there were many questions there. I, you know, I, I hope it was valuable to everybody. I don't know, Daniel, did you see any questions? 
No, uh, so. very quiet, very quiet audience today. So uh, no mm. questions. Awesome. Well, everybody, I hope I spoke slow enough. Um, sometimes I get going and I forget that I'm not on with, you know, people who have English as their primary language. So forgive me. Um, but again, this stuff will all be available on YouTube for you. Um, if it was valuable for you, I, I, I encourage you, please, gosh, by all means, you know, share it with friends. Um, we would love to, you know, spread the word on all these things. And there's a lot of links in these slides. So um, if, if you want to go check out more information, uh, I hope some of that stuff was valuable. So with that, Daniel, anything else? All right. Nope. All right, everybody. Great, buddy. Thank you so much. I, I'm all alone here, man. I had to like, I had to say hello to somebody. So, okay, everybody. Um, thank you for taking the time today uh, and enjoy your day.